Don't put your dreams to bed. You've done that enough. Now it's time to stir them up. This is your friend and host, Kirstie Fleur, with the Visionary Woman podcast. And I love resourcing the visionary woman, the creative, the artist, the business owner, the risk taker. And on this show, we will talk about what it means to get out of your own way and take your dreams to the next level. Join the conversation. Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Visionary Woman podcast. I'm your host, Kirstie Fleur. And today on the podcast, we have a friend of mine, Jordana Guillermez. Um, Hope I got that right, Jordana. I'm working on it. (laughs) But we're going to peek into Jordana's life as a fashion tech spokesperson, spokeswoman, exactly. Um, Jordana has over 15 years of experience as a marketing and public relations director in the lifestyle and fashion industries. And she resides in Florida and is the co-founder of Fashion Novation NYC um, alongside her husband and partner, Marcelo. Fashion Novation is a global platform bringing founders and CEOs together from the ecosystems of technology and fashion. The point is to adopt more sustainability through the supply chain. Um, Jordana was awarded Woman of Inspiration by Delivering Good in 2022. Uh, She's also the author of the book, It Can Be You, Humanizing Homelessness as an Inspirational and Philanthropic Project. Jordana also recently rang the opening bell at NASDAQ and is a proud mother of two little girls, Ariana and Isabella. Jordana, thank you for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and a huge fan of you and your work. So I'm thrilled. Yay. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm thinking about when we first, when I might have first met you. And I was thinking about it today. I was like, when did we first, when are we first in contact with each other? How did this happen? And I believe it was through a cohort that I was a part of called Threefold. And I think you were on there as like a teacher and speaker. And I think I might've connected with you through there. So I was like, okay, this is where, that's been a while ago. Was that in 2020? Yeah, that was around 2020. Now that you brought it up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder, like it it almost reminds me sometimes because it's so much that we do in the industry to reconnect with those types of companies because they really did amazing things. But I think it was back in 2020, yeah. Wow. So yeah, like fresh into the pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. That's amazing. Well, we've still been connecting and I've been um, also a fan of your work and watching all the the changes and um, amazing things you've been adding to the roster over there at Fashion Novation. And I'm like, we can't wait to be a part of all the things. But we want to jump in and talk about just your start, your your start in the fashion industry, really your start in PR, because you started in PR, right? Yeah, exactly. No, so it's kind of crazy. You know, like I have a very unorthodox background in terms of how I got into everything that I've done. Um, So, you know, I've always... I was brought up in Brazil. Um, My parents both like serial entrepreneurs, um, like really like worked their entire lives. And I was always around to see them host dinner parties and like be at the stores with them, watching them sell and like just always around, you know, this ecosystem of entrepreneurship. And I remember just like loving relationships, like loving them, like get someone off the street that they've never met. And then an hour later, they're buying from them and they're like best friends and are coming over our house for dinner. So because of that, it was always something that like I just took in and took in and took in. And also I had this like innate love for people, regardless of who it was. I wanted to just talk to everyone and make everyone smile and make everyone happy from when I was like two, three years old. And so like fast forward to graduating high school, I decided not to go to college because I'm like, I don't need to go to college to learn how to deal with people. I know that. So I was like, I'm just going to go into it. And I remember like working at a lot of different companies. Like I was a manager at Kohan Retail. I was a man, I was a an assistant manager for Jacques D. I worked real estate. I sold houses and commercial. I was a bank teller at back in the day, Bank of New York. Like I had every job, but every job that I had, I would get bored after a certain point because the managers would always come up to me or like my seniors and say, wow, you're doing an amazing job. People love you. So in my mind, I'd be like, okay, I'm done here. Next. And I got tired of that jump around. By the time I was 24, I had so many things that I had done already. So I decided to buy a book of careers and I came across public relations. And when I read what PR was, I was like, this is exactly who I am. Like, I love to read. I love to write. You know, I love people. I like to communicate. So 
I decided to hire, apply for one of like the hardest jobs to get that wanted college degree experience, everything I didn't have. But I was like, I'm going to get this job. And I looked up the president of the company at the time, which was a company that held licenses for brands, which included Nina Ricci, Porsche Design, Lawn Vaughn, et cetera. And when I applied, they emailed me and they said, wow, you have a lot of balls to apply for a position like this, having like nothing that we're asking for. But I uh-huh. <laughs> They're like, I want to meet you just to see who you are because I'm like shocked by this type of email. So I went to meet with the president and I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, after I told him my story and why I thought I could do it and blah, blah, blah. So he goes, look, he's like, you can learn, you know, in school, you could read a book, you could memorize, but passion comes from within. And when you talk about wanting to do this, I see the passion in you. He's like, so I'm going to give you the job, but I'm not going to pay you. You're going to work for free for three months. And if you show me that you can do the job, then I'll start to pay you. So I literally like, I was like, it's funny because I wasn't scared. I was like, I got this, even though I didn't know terms or anything. And I bought PR for dummies. I read the whole book and I was like, good. and so I would go and he would be like, write a press release. And I was like, press release. So I would Google press release and like, and then he would like, be like, call, you know, Vogue for Nina Ricci, whatever. So I would call the first time I called, I remember I was like, hi, can I talk to the person that writes for your magazine? And they're like, editorial department? I'm like, yes. So in the second call, I already knew to say editorial department. So anyway, three months went by. I got them in Vogue, Women's Health, L, Teen Vogue, like all these different publications. And they took me to Vegas for a trade show and they were like clapping for me. And they said, we'll give you the pay now. You've shown us that you could do it. And that minute when they offered to start paying me, something clicked in my head where I was like, wait, if I could do this for them and I'm going to get paid this much, why don't I just start my own PR business? So I said, no, thank you. And I started my own PR business and I was a solo. Yeah. Crazy story. And I was a solopreneur after that for 10 plus years, did PR for Interscope Records, H Stern, like traveled around the world and wherever I would find something that I wanted to do for PR, I would live there for a few months, do the job. And so that was my PR career. Yeah. <laughs> kind of crazy. Wow. No, you're talking about ballsy. That is ballsy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. It wasn't right. easy. I'll tell you, like, even when I quit, I no thank you to the pay. And I started my own business. Like, no one knew me. So they weren't going to hire me. So I literally, and at the time I was with someone who was very understanding to be able to be, you know, put up with all of that. But like, I literally had to sell my jewelry to buy Velveeta cheese and bread. And I lived off of Velveeta cheese sandwiches for, I don't know how long until things started to pick up. Um, And there were many ups and downs because, I mean, I only did three months of it and I thought I was on top of the world. And here I am starting a business. Um, But I have to say it man, I grew so much in that time. So wait, how old were you during this time frame? I was 24 to 34. Okay. And so were you married then? Did you have kids then? No. So I am, I met my husband now when I was 35. Um, okay. So I, I stayed to 34 because when I was 34, I went to Brazil on a vacation slash family trip and I met my husband and, um, And I decided like this could be the man of my life. It was the first time I felt that way after being kissed by someone and coming back from vacation and not being able to get the kiss out of my head. And I'm a Japanese. Yeah, (laughs) it was a kiss. Um, But no, (laughs) being like a Gemini woman, you know, I've never been like tied down to like, like I would have, you know, different people. I I would think I was never that type of girl, you know, that was like, Oh, I need this one. But there was something different about him. Um, So then I decided to move to Brazil and get to know him because if he was going to be my husband, I needed to give it that time. So I just like stopped doing my business and I moved to Brazil and I literally like three months after meeting him, I was already living with him. So yeah. Wow. You're kind of ballsy. Like, yeah, absolutely. You're like, okay, I found found a career. I found the, the man I want to be with. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, I think that even, you know, you sharing like the, the pitfalls there, like some of the pitfalls are in you like eating Velve- Velveeta cheese and, you yeah. know, like scrumming it for a little bit, trying to make it work. You know, people need to hear that, especially women yeah. who we can look at a woman like you on this on the surface and be like, wow, she is like doing all the things. She's talking with Versace. She's doing this. She's in all these spaces and 
she's on top of the world and sustainability and all these, all, whatever, all the things. And so we can forget that there is a journey there's a process and ours may not look like yours, but everybody has to take the journey, has to step out and yeah. say, take the risk. The, the biggest thing is what I hear is you took a lot of risk to get a where lot. you are right now. A lot. A lot. And so it was, and no cakewalk. Yeah. No. And it was very, there were very hard moments. And once we get into fashion innovation and starting that, there is another downfall that I'll share that like it, nothing is easy and no, nothing just falls in your lap. But it's like constant work with anything, whether you're talking about work, relationships, you know, your relationship with yourself, like nothing is easy. It's a process. But I think I'm very spiritual. So I've always had this like innate feeling that even in my toughest of times that I've had, I know it's supposed to be a part of my journey because it's going to make me that much stronger when I'm, I get to the right place. I think we all have a right place that we're supposed to get to. I do believe we all are here for like a certain reason. Some of right. us find it sooner than others. Some of us never find it, but it's okay because it's still the journey. And, you know, so I don't know. I'm a believer in all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Okay. So yeah, let's get into like, how did you transition transition from PR to fashion tech spokeswoman that you are today. Yeah. <laughs> That's another crazy thing. So not having experience in tech at all or really, fa I mean, PR is PR, but it's not fashion industry, right? Um, so yeah, so when I met my husband, um, it's funny because when I met him, I'll never forget, we were talking about the PR that I would do with fashion and he would come to some like little events that I would put together here and there. And he would always say, I, would, I could never work in fashion. Like I would never work in fashion. Today, he's the co-founder of Fashion Innovation. So never <laughs> say never. Um, exactly. But he, <laughs> but he worked in tech and he worked with internationalizing companies that had an innovative component from South America to the US market. That was always his background. And he was going to a lot of it, like after meeting him at 34, moved in with him, 35, got pregnant like very quickly with our first daughter, moved back to the U.S. with him to have our kids here because just better uh, quality of life here and more opportunities. Yeah. Um, so in all of that, you know, he came with me to the U.S., never lived in the U.S., only spoke Portuguese, no English, like wow. was about to be a baby. Like, how do I provide for my family? You know, was the big question mark in his head. He was like really struggling and he was going to a lot of events with this uh, South American community. And he was finding a lot of events on tech, different types of tech, but he never saw fashion and tech. So he came home one day, it was July of 2018. And he was like, would it make sense if we do a summit where it's tech with fashion and CEOs and founders? And I was like, I think so. He's like, should we try and do one? I'm like, okay, this is a good wow. <laughs> So he literally took Fast Company, top 100, like the when they have the 100 most innovative companies. He went through one by one. He did his magic that he knows how to do in finding people's contacts and literally started cold emailing founder of Shopify, partner at IBM, found out, you know, went through like a list of top fashion companies, reached out to Diane von Furstenberg, Mara Hoffman, cold emails, everybody. And we started getting really quick replies from people like those individuals I mentioned and others saying, love the idea, I'm in. When is the event? I'm flying in to speak. Now, we had no website. No one could find us on the internet. Like, there was nothing about fashion wow. innovation. Literally, we just wrote it in a piece of paper. And from July 2018, our first event was September 2018. So July, I wish to them two months. We had mm -hmm. our first event in New York during Fashion Week, over 40 speakers from some of the largest companies in the world, over 500 attendees, crazy, like crazy. So that was like our proof of concept was right there. We're like, okay, right, like we're right. doing something that people have been wanting because they came on so quickly not knowing who we were. Um, and so we started doing those events. But of course, when you start an event, no matter how big your speakers are, if no one knows about you, sponsorship is very hard to come by. So the first few events we did practically like losing a lot of money um, that mm -hmm. we didn't really have to lose. And so fast forward, like the first two, three events, we all of a sudden looked at our bank account and we're like, crap, like we're three months behind in rent. We have two babies. 
money is not coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. We're pretty much screwed. So what do we do? We left everything behind in New York. We took three small suitcases, left all of our furniture, kids' clothes, all my jewelry, everything, everything. Literally just took clothes that we needed, went back to Brazil, lived with his mom in a one-bedroom apartment, our whole family and his mom. Didn't even have money to like help his mom buy breakfast in the morning. It was like really, really tough. But we believed wow. in fashion innovation so much that we were like, no, we're going to make this turn around. It's going to turn around. It was eight months of probably the biggest struggle in my life. And if I was alone with no kids, maybe it wouldn't have been as much of a, but having kids and having them lose everything. And I even remember yeah. like, you know, eight, eight months later, like we turned it around, we paid off our debt, being living with his mom. This is where it can be. You came about by the way, the book, because it mm -hmm. could have been us if we didn't have family to take us in um, yeah. and turned everything around and came back and made the decision instead of going back to New York to come to Florida because it, you know, costs are lower. It made sense. Um, and yeah, I mean, thank God, like luckily, but also a lot of work, I would say, if that's a word, <laughs> yeah. we came to Florida and we just like made it happen. And now we're at a completely different space than we were in that moment. And our kids, it's funny because even when we got back to Florida, we would say, let's go on vacation. And then they wouldn't want to go. And I was like, why don't you want to go? And they're like, because I don't want to lose my room and my toys. And so it like, they were only yeah. one, two, but like, it's, they, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, but that, you know, it, it was worth it because we are where we are today with fashion innovation and our dreams came true of what we thought was going to happen, but it wasn't easy at all. Wow. 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 What would you say, or what do you consider success for you right now? Is this a success? Would you define where you're at right now as success for fashion innovation? So it's funny because for me, what is success? So we all need money because money drives things forward. It gives more people opportunities. Like you can, through entrepreneurship, you can help. I think it's like the biggest vehicle that you can help others. So I, yes, but I define success honestly as how many lives like are we impacting? Like how are we helping businesses grow? Like, you know, and so when I look at that, I can honestly say, and this is not being like, you know, oh, look at what we've done. But like, I can say that we've, we have so many case studies of like startups that we've connected to enterprise brands and help them have that launch to be able to keep going when it comes to the tech companies. We've worked with so many, you know, underdeveloped cities like the favelas of Brazil and giving opportunities to talent there. And when we rang the bell at NASDAQ, the first thing we did, we didn't even think about NASDAQ. Oh, let's see. We thought of, oh my God, NASDAQ, we're going to have the models of the favelas on the tower in Times Square. Let's share the news with them and be able to really uplift their souls because a lot of them were like, one of them sent us a WhatsApp when he found out saying, I went from thinking of killing myself to now being in a tower mm. in Times Square. So wow. to like be able to give those opportunities, I can say that I can consider myself, I, I can consider being in the success mode, but at the same time, I think there's still so much that we need to do. Um, so I feel like it's a work in progress, but I can tap myself on the shoulders. I used to think like, you know, because you look at this industry is very superficial is not the word because those that can help and want to help, they do, but there's still that mm -hmm. side of the industry where it's like, you know, well, I want to work with you, but you know, you're not a BOF or I want to work with you, but you're not like as big as a WWD. There's still right. that comparison of brand, even if we've done sometimes more or we can show more than they're showing, but because we don't have that brand, we are not taken as seriously as no matter how much, even after NASDAQ and everything is still as a push, it's still a battle, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like I, I just want more people to know we exist because our events are free. You know, we want to democratize information. We do as much as we can. Of course, we need to make a living. So we do have to charge and be a for-profit business. But what we can give in terms of inspiration and education, we want to just continue. The more we make, the more we're able to do that, That's you know, right. and be able to keep giving back in that way. Yeah, it's a battle. I love it. 
Yeah, yeah it is. Yes, it, it, I love what you're saying because what I'm hearing is that success is continual. You know, if you look at it that way and it's not an, an arrival point, like, oh, we've arrived. I feel like when you get there, you're stuck, you know, yeah. you've made it to that place. Where can you go from that place? You can't go anywhere, you know? And yeah. so the fact that you're like, you know, it's all about people as well. Of course, we have to be able to survive. So it's got to be, you know, socially well for us also. Um, but I love that. Um, right. For everybody. And what you just said, Mark Jacobs um, was this, Mark Jacobs. Yes. Was a speaker at the Vogue event. I went last week, the forces of fashion event that they host. And I was blown away when someone in the audience asked Mark Jacobs, when did you know that you had made it? And his answer was, I feel, he's like, I feel kind of silly to answer that question because I don't think I've made it yet. Like, I don't wow. think I'm there yet. Mark Jacobs. I was like, <laughs> okay. Me, like, Mark that, Jacobs, guys. Me, Mark Jacobs, like said, <laughs> I don't think I'm there yet. So I can't say how did it feel because I don't think I've hit that mark yet. And that for me was like such a humbling like moment to where I was like, okay, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're in good company. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It made me admire Mark Jacob feels like he hasn't arrived yet. We're in good company. <laughs> right. Okay. Exactly. I love it. So what would you credit um like this these seasons that you walk through building the company, you and your husband, what would you accredit that to? There's a level of grit that you have and this resilience because you keep going, it seems like yes. after hard stuff happens, you keep going. But what do you, what would you say is the mindset or what is it that keeps you on the track that you're on because entrepreneurship in itself is it's hard stuff yeah but I yeah just like, in the industry yeah there's ups and downs I have to say I have moments of burnout where I found myself going to events and I'm standing there and all these great people are there and in my mind I'm like what am I doing all this for like what is the purpose mm -hmm. like what's happening yeah. out of all of this and sometimes you it's very normal I think and I think even people that this is my imposter syndrome coming in because I feel like I can <laughs> be at that point. But even people that say that I consider to be doing more or bigger in terms of like, you know, awareness, let's say, um, like sometimes I feel like it's normal for us to look at what we're doing and go, is it making a difference? Are people noticing? Like, why am I doing all of this? You know, mm -hmm. but then there are moments like the NASDAQ bell ringing or even a small, this was really cool. And I'll share it. And it's so like silly, but it, for me, it's not. It made like a huge difference. And it really like pushed my button to keep going when maybe I was having a time of what am I doing this for? But when I emailed Vogue that I wanted to attend her event, I asked Tone Goodman, who's the fashion director. She's been there for 30 plus years. And I was like, you know, I'd love to go to this event. It was $2,000 a ticket. And as a startup, like it just doesn't make sense when you're trying to build a business. And I was like, I'd really love to go. And she was like, let me see what I can do. So she sends an email and this is what I tell you. Sometimes the smallest things can be like that trigger where you're like, okay, I'm meant yeah. to be doing this. She sends yeah. an email to her team. And at the end, she's like, you know, this is Jordana. She'd love to attend the event. This is what fashion innovation is. And then at the end of the email, she writes PS. She is the real deal. When I read that, I was like, I'm the real deal. And it's so silly. <laughs> like but that. it's like the fashion director at Vogue saying that about yeah. me. I was like, mm -hmm. that those are the things sometimes, like a sentence or a word, or just like seeing that somebody is like noticing and seeing the effort that you're putting in is yeah. what allows me to keep going. Um, mm -hmm. because it's very hard. The industry is very hard and it beats you up. Yeah. And there are times that really you're like, you know, and, and yeah, but then you just learn that like, it's not going to be for everybody and that everybody's going to be on board with what you're doing and that everybody's going to like you and that's okay. That's you're not, right. you're yeah. Just like, yeah, you're not meant to be everybody's cup of tea and just focus on the ones that are, you are their cup of tea and just put a lot of love into those because those will like trigger to like other circles, you know? And like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just, yeah, it's just like you're meant to have your tribe. And then if you just focus on them and give them all your love and support and do whatever you can to just keep uplifting them, they're also going to continue to uplift you and you guys get uplifted together. And that's where the magic is. 
I love that. I love that. I, I talk to so many women who are in business or either aspiring to start businesses. And one of the things is, um, you know, well, what if they don't like this? Or what if I do this and they don't? And I'm like, okay, yeah, there is like, okay, what's proof of concept? Does uh, Do they actually want this out here? There's that piece. Yeah. But it's also like, are you going to continue over and over and keep changing the thing? What are you passionate about? Why are you doing what you're doing? And land on that. That's the that's the stoop you have to land on. Why am I doing this? I'm passionate about this, so that's why I'm doing this. But to constantly change over and over, you know, you'll be forever changing yourself because, like you said, you're not going to be everybody's yeah. cup of tea. It's not going to happen. But you can find that community or that group or those people who are yeah. like, okay, this is for me, finally. And then yeah. you start realizing that you're creating something for people. You're like, okay, this is, I, I feel my, these are my people. So it's yes. almost like a, a, a little tribe or community that you're building by saying yes to your own voice, exactly. your own vision, your own dreams. So I love that. I love it. One of the things I wanted to chat with you about is your you adopting a more sustainable supply chain. What made you think or what made you lean into sustainability the way that you have? So I always say my sustainability purpose is people, right? So it goes back to people. I feel like there's sustainability in terms of like the textiles, there's sustainability in terms of how the workers are treated or sustainability in terms of diversity, equality, inclusion. And I think for me, it lies in that DEI space. It lies in like the people space. And so I just, you know, especially with everything that happened during like COVID and like, you know, BLM and all these things that took place in the world, like it just almost like reinforced like my reason for bringing everybody together under the same light, giving everybody the same platform. So like during COVID, you know, we had fabric makers in Nigeria. We had artisans in India speaking in Hindi with translators on our web and our events. We had Rebecca Minkoff, Steve Madden. We had startup designer. We had students. And I think that for me is where I look at sustainability. And it's something that I've always been like, there's no other way for me. Like, there's no, like, other, like, I don't understand when people, like, even everything that's going on today, like, I don't get how people can separate each other through, like, religion, race, ethnicity, background, color. Like, I don't get it. Right. I don't get it because yeah. it doesn't sink into, like, who I am. Um, yeah. So with that being said, I think, you know, for me, it's always been about people throughout the supply chain, not necessarily about, like, what's being made and how it's being made in terms of textile. It's just, it's as important. It's very important, of course. Mm -hmm. But I do also believe that it's going to take a very long time for like everyone in the world to understand sustainability. As much as we talk about it as an industry, I even know through my own like family, extended family, if I say sustainability, they're like, what is that? And then if mm -hmm. I tell them, they're like, Oh, I'm like, do people really care? Like people really answer in those ways though. There's a lot of people yeah. that don't get it. And so for me, it's just about like, how do you treat everything in your life? Like, how do you treat like if, okay, I bought this sweater at the Vogue event. Um, and I honestly, I don't know if it's like sustainable. I don't know, but I do know that it's a great material. I know that it's a color that is never going to get old. There's not too much going mm -hmm. on with it. I'm going to be able to wear it for a very long time. So for me, it's like, you know, once, let's say in 10 years, because I really do keep my clothes for a very long time for people that know me, <laughs> Same. I just yeah. take care of it, you know? And then when I do give it away or when I don't want it anymore, I either give it to a church so then somebody else can use it, or I give it to, like, my family members. We're always, like, closet swapping. So I just think oh, it's, yeah. like, you know, it's just, like, how do you treat anything? Like, how do you treat people first and foremost? And then how do you treat the things in your everyday life, your clothes, your house? Do you wake up and make your bed? Like, it's just sustainability is just like a sustainable way of life. It's how I look at it rather yeah. than like the bits and pieces that make up of the fabric. You know what I mean? So it's just yeah. a different way of Absolutely. looking at it. I love that. And now that I know you're into closet swapping, I'm going to have to figure out if you are the same size. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Because I'm all about <laughs> it. Swap out. Right. I love it. I've made it a friend thing. So when my friends come over, I'm like, bring things they don't wear anymore. We open a bottle of wine and we just like swap. And then I have a whole new wardrobe. I don't even, I, I actually... I never I love that. Okay, you're gonna have to invite me. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be wine, but you could you absolutely okay. Good. <laughs> you like you don't have to. I'm like, no, no, bring the wine. 
<laughs> I love it. Well, let's, um, what are some, uh, maybe some guiding words for those who are seeking uh, to figure out their own voice and their own place in business, maybe some of your tried and true uh, tips or something like that that you may share as we're we're ending on the podcast. I would say one is like, no idea is a bad idea. It's just an untried idea. And if it doesn't work, it can just mesh into your next big idea. So like whatever mm -hmm. you have as an idea, just like you don't need Honestly, for most things, unless it's product driven, if it's like, you know, anything that you want to create um, and even product, like because nowadays with AI, honestly, you can create an entire collection, do a photo shoot in yeah. Egypt on a camel with a supermodel wearing clothes that don't yet exist. The whole thing is based on AI. Just put it out. Someone wants to buy it, made to order and boom, like, you know, so you, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> be innovative yeah honestly any idea you have just like try to implement it just go for it because then you'll learn mm -hmm. along the way don't wait for everything to be perfect to start something that's definitely number one um yeah. and I know because I've done it and even if I've had my struggles throughout it it got me to where I am today so that's one and then the second thing is reach out to anybody that you want to talk to the no you already have we all already have the no so yeah what's the worst that could happen you get a no but you already had that even if you didn't reach out to that person so right. just like you know and you'd be surprised people the most successful people and the real successful people they want to help others like it's part of their dna i don't think you get to a certain level and stay at that certain level, more importantly, than get there, because maybe some people have gotten there that don't have that big heart all the time. But like, get there and stay there. Those individuals, they want to give back their time because it gets to a point where they don't really, they're at a point where they're like, okay, like now I just want to help others. Like a lot of people yeah. have that mentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, so and then also those that haven't gotten there yet, if you reach out to them, they want to collaborate, they need new ideas. So just That's go right. after, you know, go after you don't know we already have and no idea is a bad idea. Just start somewhere and then let it guide you. And then as you make mistakes, you'll be like, Oh, I need to implement this. Oh, I forgot about this, but start. Because if you don't start, starting is the hardest part. Like many people is yeah. just starting is like, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if I should just start and then let, yeah. it, let it lead. I love it. It's like Nike. Just do it, huh? Just, just get out it. there. <laughs> I love it. Well, Jordana, tell us how we can connect with you. If they're listening to the podcast right now, where do they go to find your projects or your contributions? Thank you so much. So LinkedIn for me is really great. Um, it's just Jordana Gimera is my name. Um, and yeah, that I am always on there. Instagram also, it's I am, I am Jordana Gimera is my full name. Um, that's my personal. I always give my personal because I really, again, I, I, am, I feel like I'm like beating a dead horse saying this all the time, but I love people. It's a genuine yeah. thing. Like, if you reach out to me about anything, like I have students that reach out, I'm writing a thesis. Can I have a 30 minute zoom with you? Some of them get surprised when I say yes, which I think is it's kind of mind blowing to me. <laughs> like it's thirty minutes. Like why would I say no? Why would I not reply? Yeah. You know. So like anything, you know. So yeah, those two I think are like the best to get in touch with me personally, and then to find out more about Fash Innovation is just F A S H Fash Innovation um, And on there, honestly, there's so much content. So we've had now. 830 speakers in the last five years and all the wow. videos are up on the website if you go to events watch you'll see every single video curated and edited and you could watch conversations and just get inspired by so many incredible people that's right oh you can also watch the pitch competition i was a part of yes <laughs> i forgot yes. that was like maybe 2022 was it yeah. yeah it's on there it's all on there yes that is fun. Well, Jordana, thank you so much for being with us on the show today, sharing your time, your knowledge with us. Um, and yeah, we'll see you next time. I love that. I feel like, I mean, I honestly feel like I've known you for longer. So like it's talking to a friend and I'm happy to have done this with you. So thank you so much for having Amazing. me. Amazing.
Yay. Thank you so much. All right, All right guys. You can find us on KirstieFloor.com. You can also find us on IG and on YouTube. Those links for everything you just heard today will be in the show notes. So you can go and watch the episode live and watch us talk here, but you can also go and listen in your podcast uh, podcast app or in Spotify if that's your thing. So we'll see you next time on the Visionary Woman Podcast. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and joining the conversation today here on the Visionary Woman Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to join our growing community, the FF Social Club, please comment, like, and subscribe so that you can be updated on our upcoming episodes and more happening over at freedomfloor.com. To catch the latest from me and to access amazing resources for visionaries just like yourself, please visit me on the web at www.kirstiefloor.com. Thanks again for hanging out with me and I'll see you next time. Until then, don't forget to be visionary.